class. There we go. So that means I begin. Yeah. Okay. So I'm really glad that I was able to be part of that and be part of the sensor team here at MTSU. I'm Judith Iriarty Gross. So I want to tell you how we got involved with sensor. And I don't have my glasses on. Um, first, we wanted to do something different for our gen ed science. And I worked with Maury Weller in physics and astronomy. She and I were both teaching their traditional physical science class. And we said there has to be something better to help students learn the science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So we uh, gave a talk about some changes we made into the lab portion of the class in lovely San Diego in the spring. I think it was in 2005. And as a result of that, that talk, we each gave a presentation. We were invited to become part of the National Sensor Group. So let me tell you a little bit about the very traditional class, as you might imagine. Gen Ed requirement, non-science major students, pre-service teachers, they need to know science, pre-service nurses at that time, and we had about 1,300 students per semester. So it was a huge class and a huge impact we can make if we can make them more science literate. And at that time, there were also large DFW rates. I don't know if that's still true. It might be. But with our class, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, we've really minimized those rates. So we realized that we were teaching as, what, as how we were taught, lecture, 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 lecture. With this physical science class, we had to cover 24 chapters in 14 weeks. And this was 24 chapters of physics, chemistry, geology, and astronomy, with a lot of math involved. And again, these are non-science majors. And they're asking, why do we need to know all this? So the students typically memorized what they needed to know for a test. They repeated it, memorized what they needed for a test, and repeated it, and so on and so forth. So, and this was the attitudes where they literally said, I hate science, but I have to take it because I want to graduate from MTSU. And this was in one of our old classrooms. This is one of our old laboratories where we had very traditional lab activities. What is the value of G, the force of gravity? We know what it is, so why do our students have to figure it out? Right? What is the pH of vinegar? We know what it is. Why do they have to figure it out? And there was other Kepler's laws. Kepler figured that out ages ago. Why do they have to figure it out? You know, let's let's do something different where they can see how science relates to their lives. Another traditional classroom. So it's a picture of me with Mari Weller. And again, I think I jumped the gun early with the story. We were just trying to figure out what we could do differently, because we both wanted to change. So the first thing, as I said, we changed the labs. Okay, from another example, determine the formula of a metal salt. Why did they need to know that? To going green, where they see the effect of carbon dioxide on temperature in, in the little planets, which were tanning jars. And one of the students had to blow into a planet and make extra carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere. And they measured the temperature difference. So I could see what's really happening with global climate change. And here are some of the other labs uh, with some of my students testing them out. Uh, she looks very happy. I, I can't remember what. Oh, that was a calorimetry lab that we did. Um, Rebecca here did some neat uh, research with me. And this is one where we were out burning food. So we made the lab stink. 
but they were trying to determine how much fat is really in their favorite munchie, something that they were in interested in, as opposed to <clears throat> figuring out how many calories we need to whatever. <laughs> so we can make some very positive changes. And again, they kept saying we can't do math. But one thing that we decided to do with this class was to give them a formula sheet. I know the formulas because I use them 10 billion times a year. But they don't need to need, know the formulas. They need to know how to use them to apply them. <coughs> and this, again, I jumped forward. I'm sorry. that uh, I went too fast. We, we were invited to attend the summer, Sensor Summer Institute in 2005 in San Jose, California, which was very nice. And we know the way. I don't sing, but we know the way. <laughs> and they usually have this about every other year. So the next one, I think, is going to be at the Air Force, not the Air Force Academy, West Point in New York. We were just at Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, after that first institute, we began our sensor journey. So we wanted to make the course relevant to our students. We included more writing because our non-majors should be able to write. Some of them do, some do not. We included a focus on current issues. Again, we developed our inquiry-based labs, and we continued doing this lab development every year, improving it, making it a little bit better. We developed course themes, and we kept looking at how can we change this gen ed science torture, as they think, for non-majors? How can we make it satisfying to them? How can we make it relevant? So one thing that we had the students do was to write a letter to the governor when the coal ash spill happened in East Tennessee. What did they think about it? And they had to write a letter to the governor. We still have them write editorials. They do presentations. Next Wednesday, um, from 1 to 3 p.m. in the Honors College lo Lobby, we're going to have my classes doing presentations on CSI. Do they correctly report the science and the crime things on TV or in the movies? So come see them. They're doing some interesting demonstrations, including taking fingerprints with cocoa powder. We'll see how that works. I let them go with it. Are these your gen ed students? These are my gen ed students. My honors, I teach an honors class this semester. And, and they're excited about it presenting. And they had to write a proposal to Dean Lyle and ask for money to buy their supplies. They had to talk to uh, Ms. Lyons to get space reserved. They are kind of slow in marketing, but I reminded them about that today. So uh, it's, it's going to be interesting. Oh, and also they have, along with Sensor, and I know Carol will like this. They have a giving back project always. And this semester, they decided to uh, collect spare change for the domestic violence, violence shelter here in Murfreesboro. So come in and throw some spare change into their jars. One of them kept saying, well, let's help the campus cats, because Dr. Gross likes cats. But I said, no, it's just not, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So a lot of things we had to think about, and tell me when I'm running out of time, please, was to uh, look at our resources. Campus politics was biggie. Uh, talk to gen ed folks. Get course approval, which we did. Think about our space. We're now in AMG 115. I'm not going to have that space any longer after this semester, which is a shame. But so be it. It's campus politics again. We went after money. We got a campus technology grant, the PAF grant, to renovate, the, to get some equipment. That was the first one. Faculty development grant. We got campus technology grant to renovate that classroom. This was a biggie. National Science Foundation Course Curriculum and Laboratory Improvement. It's not called CCLI anymore. They always change their acronyms. We got $200,000 to make changes in this course and to share our results with other folks across the United States. Um, and that was the name of our grant. If you want to see a copy of it, let me know. I'll be glad to share that with you. So we thank NSF, and that's from 
I forget from where that picture was. I took a lot of pictures. Maybe that was in California also. So setbacks, again, space. People don't like walk all the way over to AMG, even from the new science building. I drive, I'm sorry, I gotta drive. Get too old to walk. Um, money to buy supplies. Again, politics. Content. We don't cover everything that's required by the uh, traditional physical science class. But why do these students need to know everything? As I point out to my students, we can look at the Wall Street Journal, which my husband gets and I read sometimes. That they will talk about the science of bowling. They'll talk. They'll have editorials about global climate change. They'll have a little bit of something about everything we're talking about in our center class. So we uh, publicized. We promoted ourselves. Why not publicize our success? Earn the support of the provost <coughs> and dean. Started doing some science education research, and we got the Gen Ed course approval, and we got it also approved by honors. So this new course has a new number to set it apart from the 1030-1031. It's called Contemporary Issues in Science. We talk about energy and, and the environment. Tennessee Science, where I teamed up with Mary Hofschwally in history, and she taught Tennessee history. I taught Tennessee Science, and we had a learning community. That was a very fun class, because when she was talking about uh, the prohibition, during the 1930s, I was talking about the chemistry of ethanol and alcohols, and we went down to Jack Daniels and took a tour, and they told us about the science. We also went to uh, Stones River Battlefield, where we were looking at the history of the Civil War, and we had a park ranger who told us about, he had his master's in the history of science, so he was wonderful. And he was talking about the difference between a musket and a rifle, and then I'll never forget this. And he was telling us that the students were listening very carefully. And then he said, OK, who can tell me the difference? How do these things work? That was the key. How do they work? And one student said, you pull the trigger, which was right. Science in the movies, I've been doing this because the students like this. I think two semesters ago, my class decided to do the science of the Avengers. And they were pulling the science out of the different char characters. Did a wonderful job. Again, we're doing CSI stuff this, this semester. So come see us on the 19th, 1 to 3, Honors College Lobby. Uh, we don't call a lab the lab, but we call it an activity period because not only do we do our non-traditional labs during this activity period, we also give them time to work on their projects, like science in the movies or the CSI stuff, so they won't have to run out to a job. They can work with their group during this time. They also do joint problem solving. I assign problems that they have to work on together and help each other, peer mentoring, peer teaching. And, and they feel comfortable with each other asking questions. So I wanted to share some student comments. I really like this first one. Hard work. Hard work really determines what you retain and improves your grade. We know that. But she learned that. She learned it. That was very good. And we take the time to write comments on labs and projects and tests, not just, you got it wrong. This is why you got it wrong. And the last one, somebody learned to read more, which is good, too. And most of the time, these are freshmen, but sometimes we'll have an upper-level student who has waited till the last minute to take the class. And are we there yet? Why did I put that there? No, OK. I'm sorry, it's just been, I've got two proposals due on Friday. One for 3 million and one for 300,000. So keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, we're looking at more research data through sensor. And this could be a whole nother seminar. Uh, we learn about the student assessment of learning, of, of learning gains, or the SAUG, where we ask the students, what did you learn? And uh, <clears throat> compared to what is the value for G? What did you learn? And that's a very powerful question to ask our students. Um, we always have to recruit to fill the class. Again, we've got to look at departmental politics. Content, context, 
content, content, but I guarantee my students will do better than other students. We got to get over the teachers we were taught, and we really have to look at how are we helping our pre-service teachers, our students here. More pictures of our lab in action. Here's where we had a panel of students defending global climate change or not. And they're doing their munchy lab up there. And I think that was it. Thank you so much. Any questions? Because I have to, I'm sorry, I can't stand, stay for you all. But I have to run back to my class. Most of these are still honors sections. I would love to do an honors section, but we've got to get people in the hall yeah. and get a fill. Yeah. Which I think would be wonderful. I do this during May session, but it's 14 weeks and 13 days in a lot of people don't want to do that. So, so do you have any ideas? Let me know. Because I would have loved to offer it to you. Yeah, I, I would love for you to. <laughs> I think that would be great. Yeah. Thank so, you. That was wonderful. Any well, elementary pre-service teachers who want to do their pre-service teachers? Um, they're not allowed to be because they don't have any content in it. Content, content, content. If you're teaching, you must have content. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's what they need. I need supportive. related to public policy and the chemistry, blah, 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 blah. Um, but all of these, um, the majority of CINSA courses, as far as I know, the majority of CINSA courses are open for non-major courses, uh, non-majors. And uh, it's kind of challenging to implement CINSA course for design in CINSA course for science majors. Um, the major reason for that is the time issue. Like, as Judith uh, addressed before, department policy is we want to 
cover all of the contents in, for example, general chemistry. And we don't have enough time to go forward beyond the material, the content in, in the general chemistry course. So, and uh, Michael, I'm teaching general chemistry and the intermediate in organic chemistry. Um, so what I'm thought is, I thought is, um, I think of, well, how can I um, extend my topic to civic engagement, to civil engagement in my general chemistry class, and also not to sacrifice too much, sacrifice to the content um, in the process. So um, then I think maybe I should talk about some green chemistry related topic in my lecture. Um, maybe not every class, you know, once per week, bring some um, real issues, environmental issues, um, societal issues, related, green chemistry related topic to my lecture. So what is green chemistry? Now why would I want to teach green chemistry? Because as you can see, the green chemistry is the design of chemical products and process that reduce or eliminate the generation of hazardous substances. And this is the definition by EPA. But in fact, um, this is a pretty narrow definition. And we certainly need to expand that into broader area, like how to you know, engage the, put, put the civic engagement into this area. And there's a, um, so compare this green chemistry and the sensor principle, it, it, they are matching with each other very well. Um, so the goal, my specific goal on teaching green chemistry to the class is to train students to think about minimizing environmental impacts on social and economic costs. And also inspire students with the potential impact of scientific research to solve global problems related to green chemistry. The last one, engage students in hands-on authentic green chemistry research. So since I'm teaching general chemistry, and this is a course, it's a two semester course. And that uh, course is to teach the students with basic chemical principles. And it's open to most of the freshman students, science major. And through taking this course, those first year students are expected to know all of the basic chemistry concepts and to make them more prepared, better prepared for upper level chemistry course, such as physical chemistry, analytical chemistry, and organic chemistry. It sounded as a basic concept course, but indeed it was very challenging for a lot of first year students because they just come from high school and some of them don't have enough math knowledge, mathematics knowledge to take this course. As a result, this course has a notorious, not notorious low success rate, the DSW rate. Um, so, and also another problem is the students got easily bored. They got, they feel the course is tedious because we teach so much content, like physical chemistry, analytical chemistry, on how to do stoichiometry calculations, draw the loose structures, chemical bonding. They are very physical, and the students get tedious when they you know, continue the course. So one way I'm thinking, well, we talk about some related, like a real issues in society, the environmental issues, health issues, um, and put them as a small topic and uh, fit that in into the general chemistry class. So um, at the same time, I don't want to, I want to compromise to the time. So what I did is to, you know, teach this so-called grand moment um, per week, grand moment per week, once per week um, on my Gen Chem class. Um, each time is about five to 10 minutes. And uh, each time we talk about a specific topic. Um, so for example, I'll give you one example. Um, when I teach the chapter of aqueous solution, at the beginning of the chapter, I give this grand moment to the class. First of all, I show the students some pictures, two pictures um, shown for Florida Keys in 1980 and 2010, and I let students guess what they are. They easily you know, identify they are coral reefs, and then, then ask them 
why do you think those in, you know, pictures taken in 2010, the car race disappeared? They said most of students know that it's because of a human activity, but they didn't know exactly what kind of human activities caused that to disappear. And uh, then I answered them, it's not a pure human activity. Well, it's caused by human activities, but it's not like human beings go to the, you know, at the bottom of the sea and pick them up. It is because of the ocean acidification. And that ocean acidification is caused by carbon emission, the increased amount of carbon emission, global warming issue. So when the CO2 um, dissolving in the, in the ocean, the ocean was acidified, and that kills um, a lot of the marine organisms. So then um, I showed them some pictures like these, um, you know, the corrosive effect of CO2 to marine organisms, you know, see those beautiful, well, not, well, the picture looks beautiful, but it's not really, uh, it's a disaster. Um, and uh, then um, I talk about the concept related to Jenkins, like what is, you know, why CO2 can dissolve in water? Why nitrogen, dinitrogen gas cannot dissolve in water to give us, you know, um, acidic ocean water? It's because CO2, you know, has uh, that, that strong loop structure of CO2 and nitrogen, compare them, explain the reason um, from the chemical bonding video. And then I, I let the students draw the chemical equations of CO2 dissolution in water. And, uh, and finally, you know, why this acidic water can kill the microbes, the, the uh, marine microorganisms, because those um, seashells and the urchins spines, they are made by calcium carbonate, and they can react with these acids. So you know, during this process, so this is a question I show the students and explain each question. And these, these questions, all common Jenkins questions that you, the students can, can, can see in, in the test, very, very common uh, questions. And they should know them anyway. They should know them anyway. So I think by using this example, it let them memorize or you know, understand, um, figure that out so better. Um, Another of my approach is to integrate an authentic research lab session to bring chemistry course uh, and, and the chemistry lab courses. This approach is, has just really just started and I haven't, because I'm not a lab coordinator and um, I need to you know, do more work to collaborate with them to make this happen eventually. But um, in my research lab, because we, we are supposed to do a lot of uh, research activities in the lab, I have a master's student and an undergrad student. And uh, right now, one of the projects going undergoing is uh, making the siren from cinnamon bark. And uh, we know siren is an important industrial monomer. And uh, you know, if you want to make polysiren, you have to start from siren, which is the monomer. And the siren is made from uh, fossil fuels. Yeah. But, uh, we know someday in the future we will running out of fossil fuels. And so what we should do? Um, so we need to look out alternative way to generate siren. And then one is a way to do decarbonylation from cinnamon aldehyde. And cinnamon aldehyde is a, a, the major chemical from essential oil of cinnamon bark. So that is a generated valuable chemicals from um, biofeedstock, um, biomass conversion. Biomass conversion, and um, we are looking. We are doing research on looking for um, environmental benign metal catalyst to finish this reaction, to, to fulfill this reaction. And if we have some good results, um, we can talk to organic lab coordinator to see whether we can integrate this experiment. Because you know, really, it's a very simple experiment. We just mix the catalyst and the cinnamon aldehyde together and heat it up, and then and generate siren. So I think, and then the students can do the GTMS and do analysis. It's easy experiment. It's a, it's approachable for the students to use and to see what, what we can integrate into organic lab course. And again, yeah, this this project is supported by MTSU Clean Energy Committee. Thanks for them and for their support. Um, third approach is to bring noted green campus to MT. PSU campus um, because there are in the US there are many institutions have already started this journey like bring the brain chemistry topic to the campus around the 
around the campus. And the University of Minnesota, uh, we have Dr. Bill Tolman visit uh, last month, October, and he gave a talk on plastic from plants. So that is a good, perfect fit with sustainable chemistry. And uh, I required all of my students in class, my Gen Chem and Intermediate Inorganic Chemistry class attend this seminar. And uh, this, uh, the seminar was very successful. The room was full filled and uh, some students could in, couldn't even get in because it's already filled. And uh, the students' feedback was really good. They thought it was a great talk. They learned a lot. So they were talking about plastic from plants. You know, we know those plastic we use every day, they are not decomposable. Like we accumulate it in the ocean, generate a lot of pollution. Um, and if we created plastic bio decomposable, compatible plastic from plants, it could sort of solve that problem. So it's a really big issue, environmental issue. But anyway, I think when this um, noted brain chemist from the other institutions, the MTSU can um, you know, get everyone awareness and atten attentiveness to the brain chemistry. So um, overall, we expect by integrating brain chemistry to teaching the research, we expect to see you know, an increase in retention rate, and we can inspire students to pursue STEM fields, um, increase graduation rate, and train future scientists, and increase STEM literacy. Um, and also, there's a tiny program going on supported by MTSU Clean Energy B. Um, so I proposed this program last year. I, I, uh, in my proposal, I, I, you know, I proposed those activities of research, education, collaboration, and, and public outreach. And aiming to develop new sustainable technology and educate the next generation of researchers, which will ultimately benefit our MTSU community. This program is still going on. We get it renewed this year, and we still do some little activities every year. Um, finally, I um, propose uh, applying a new course, open a new course, which is called a Green Chemistry, and uh, hopefully I can open it in next year, fall semester. Thank you all for it. So would that course be uh, an upper division course? It should be, yeah, for senior and or and uh, graduate students. Okay. Will it be hard, I think? Do you see it being hard at the program this Um. Yeah, we will we'll cover a lot of research topics and also public policy. Do they have a, do you see there being a passion project for that course or something where they have to develop, design, or create something that would have a mm -hmm. broader impact? No, I don't think so. We will talk about some successful work activities, uh, innovation, uh, successful stories, because it's really hard. Or even a, a, a plan, so they create it. Yeah, yeah. Plan yeah, they, you know, we ask them to try to add to, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so now I'm up. Um, and I'm Drew Sig. I'm actually, I'm a biologist, but I'm stationed in the Honors College, so I'm a dedicated honors faculty. Um, and I was brought in um, last year to start trying to mix up some of the ways that they teach their introductory biology courses, as well as start offering new honors courses as well. And so there have been a couple of different ways that I've approached that, but the one I'm going to focus on today is called the Small World Initiative. And so it's a program that I'm piloting currently this semester with majors and non-major freshmen. So the introductory biology um, for freshmen, all about authentic research. So they're doing a uh, semester-long research project that is pertinent to things they've heard about in the news as opposed to the stock can cookie cutter labs that, that the other sections are doing. Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this because Judith already kind of got the point across. Um, but as most of you are aware, we are seeing an increase in uh, opportunities for STEM jobs and STEM fields. Um, these are increasing. We're expecting to see about a million more in the next couple of years. Um, and most of these jobs require at least a bachelor's degree in a STEM field. So we need to get people um, retained within the STEM fields as undergraduates so they can graduate to then fill these jobs and these positions. And if you Google STEM education, you can find all kinds of, of infographics that are really visually appealing like this, even though they don't really tell you too much. Um, where they're saying, look at all these opportunities in STEM, you should get into STEM too, it's really cool. Granted, they could be deceptive, like 10% versus 21%, and they've got this giant arrow and no arrow, so like, as a scientist, it bugs me that they don't have it fit up quite the right way, but they're trying to get people interested, right? They're trying to catch people's eye and say, hey, you should go into science, technology, engineering, and math. 
Um, but the problem is that about 40% of the students that come in saying, I'm going to be a doctor, or I'm going to go into science, or I'm going to do math, um, about four, only about 40% of them actually end up completing that degree that they set up for. And the two main issues with this are, early on, their introductory labs are very uninspiring. And I love the term cookie cutters. It's just week one, we're doing this. Week two, you're doing this. And it reads, the, it's like a step-by-step -step direction as opposed to try and actually find something out. And I see lots of nodding heads, so you guys get it. Um, an alternative, we, uh, additionally, a lot of students come in and have insufficient math or science preparation. I had um, AP biology students come in into my honors course last year, and I set a beaker in front of them the first day, and we were going to do an activity where they had to um, make a boat that could float out of clay, and they had, to, they had to be able to hold the most amount of marbles possible. It was just a way to get it using a balance, using a beaker, measuring volume, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, okay, go ahead and grab 300 mils. And I knew most of these students had been AP students, and they looked at me like I was crazy because they'd never used a beaker before in their high school classroom. And they were AP students. And then I asked them about this, and they said, oh, we only did one lab in AP chemistry. It was to build molecular models with gummy bears and um, toothpicks, but we had to stop halfway through because kids were eating the gummy bears and stabbing each other. So, like, we have issues coming forward about what an AP course or what an honors course in high school is, and we have to adjust accordingly to help students. And here, here's an, another wonderful infographic that gets the point across really well. On the left, it's a big hodgepodge of lines, I know. But on the left, you're seeing um, what students are majoring in versus what they actually go into their careers for. And so what they've highlighted are different. So you've got your STEM fields here. And in engineering, you've got about 50% of engineering majors staying in engineering fields. So the colored lines are they stuck with it. Okay. The physical sciences, it's about 20%. Biological sciences, we're seeing a, a tremendous loss in terms of people that are majoring in biology versus doing things that could be considered a STEM field. And so this is a major problem, and we're trying to find new ways to engage students to want to have that line be a little bit thicker. And this is a, um, it's not just a, a local university thing, it's a, it's a presidential level issue as well. So two years ago, Obama, uh, President Obama released a call to action, it's the Engage to Excel program had several different components. Um, one was to increase our STEM graduates in the US by a third. Um, and to do this, focus on the first two years of college. You need to hook them into science early on so that then when they get into their upper division classes, it's not three years before they get to actually do a real experiment. They get to see it early on. And it's not just towards R1 institutions or private liberal arts schools or community colleges. This is a broad overview. Right? All universities in the US should be tackling this issue. And the overall goal is retention. So let's fill those jobs. Let's get people graduating in STEM fields. And so if you actually look through the Engage to Excel program, it breaks down into five major classifications. And the one that I'm going to focus on for my part of the talk here is replacing these cookie cutter lab uh, courses with authentic research. Okay. And so this is the direct quote for this. It's advocated provide support for replacing standard lab courses with discovery-based research courses. In other words, no more of this passive attitude towards science. You want little Neil deGrasse Tysons. I'm sorry I can't hear you over the sound of how awesome science is. You want them excited and engaged and wanting to be a scientist. And so the, the, being a biologist, you know, I was thinking about how I could play to my strengths in order to help develop a course around this. And I settled on looking into um, the, the rise of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So it's a very common thing. A lot of people have heard about it. Um, this is Staphylococcus aureus. It can, the uh, antibiotic resistant form of this is called MRSA, methicillin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. So that's what methicillin looks like. Um, and what we're seeing is this, this exponential rise in methicillin resistant bacteria um, over time. And it's not just with this particular um, infection. We see it here's Enterococcus faecium doing the same thing against uh, vancomycin. Um, we start seeing resistance to the antibiotic vancomycin um, starting in the early 90s, and it's rising from from there. Vancomycin was introduced into Canada in the mid-90s. It hasn't taken off quite yet, but this is sort of an outdated um, figure. It's starting to climb up in Canada as well. And there's a reciprocal problem with this in that we have increases in antibiotic-resistant bacteria, but the amount of drugs in the drug pipeline is exponentially decreasing. So in the past five years, we've had one new antibiotic come out. And a couple in the pipeline, but they're, they're way far behind. So Bacteria are evolving resistance to our drugs faster than we can find new ways to combat them. And there's a whole another lecture involved with why that is, but I won't get into. 
Um, but it's, it's common in the news, and students hear about this problem. So antibiotic resistance warnings remain unheeded. So this was a month ago. And then to be especially pertinent, antibiotic resistance could be worse than Ebola. So they're hearing about these issues all the time. And so my background is in um, chemical ecology slash natural products chemistry. And so my, my expertise is in, in finding um, secondary metabolites and compounds that can be used for medicines and drugs and things like that. And this is a process that's been going on for technically hundreds of years, um, but natural um, plants and bacteria and fungi are, are great sources for, for new drugs and novel chemical structures that can be used for these purposes. So penicillin and, and aspirin are two good examples of this coming from Willow and penicillium. Um, but the best source for new antibiotics actually come from the soil. And so about three quarters of the antibiotics we currently use are derived from some form of soil bacteria. And just one common genus in, in, um, in the terrestrial soils produces over 100,000 secondary metabolites that could be used for a variety of different things. Um, and there's a ton of other species that just haven't even been discovered yet. So we can't even screen them because we've never isolated them before. Um, we, we've uh, measured several, uh, five to 6,000 bacterial species and identified them. There's probably several million that are left to be identified. So there's a big, wide open uh, source for new, new drugs that can be used to target this problem. And so playing off of what I knew as a background, what I've done for research, I got involved in something called the Small World Initiative. And it's a Yale-based initiative. Um, and they, they recruit about 15 faculty across the country and internationally per year to develop courses involved in this project. And so it's an authentic research project. It has, the labs are semester long, they're challenging, but they're rewarding. Students are participating in this search for new drugs. They are not just passively doing something people have done before, it's all new. Um, and it's uh, applied to a real world problem. Right? And so this past summer I went up to Yale, there's, there's me in the back. Um, the PI on this is Joe Handelsman, who just recently, she wasn't there for the training session because she was currently getting appointed by the Senate to be Obama's president, uh, their, their scientist, science advisor. Um, but you take a bunch of uh, faculty and you put them back in a lab setting and we figure out ways to, to apply this kind of curriculum um, at, at your home institution. And so I was representing a regional university. We had several community college faculty, some R1 faculty, and some private level R1 faculty. So it's going across the board. Um, and this is just a map showing some of the other, other locations and schools. Um, it needs to be updated, but we're the only school in Tennessee that's currently doing this. And here's the basic process for the non-biologists in the room. But students go out, and they get some soil. They then dilute that soil and then plate it. And there's all kinds of different experimental decisions that students have to make. What kind of media, what kind of nutrient requirements do you want to give? How do you make a dilution? How do you measure volumes? Things like that. Um, and then they look at these plates that they get. And they're looking for evidence that maybe some bacteria are preventing the growth of other bacteria around them. So this isn't the best image for that. I have better coming up. But like this colony here has this little zone around it where nothing else is growing. So these are little visual cues that students are saying, maybe it's exuding something that will prevent growth. And so they take those and they plate them. And so now they have this panel of 20 bacteria that they can do all sorts of stuff with. And then through the rest of the semester, they, they screen these panels, these, these isolates, to see, do they produce antibiotics? Are they in turn resistant to antibiotics? And what are they? And is it chemical based? So they get to do chem chemical extraction, um, various um, simple bioassays, as well as genetics and genomics. And these are freshmen majors and non-majors. Yeah, and what course is it? It's biology 11, 10, and 1030, honor sections. So I, there, there's one section of each, um, and I'm teaching both of them. Um, but there are three other sections of 11, 10 that are not doing this. So I'm trying it out. So additionally, so we're screening for antibiotic production. We're also doing gene sequencing, Sanger sequencing, to see if they've isolated new species, or just to see what species they isolate to begin with. Um, we're, due to it being a pilot, we're not getting as far as in this part as I wanted to the first go around, but the idea is you get visual evidence that this bacteria might be exuding a compound. The next step is, is it actually a chemical that's doing it? So you have to throw up a bunch of the bacteria and then do chemical extractions and then purify it. And that's, that's where my background is, but I don't know if we're going to be able to get to it this semester. And then we're also screening these guys to see whether or not they're also antibiotic resistant. And that leads to lots of conversations of how do bacteria in the soil become resistant to something like vancomycin, right? And we can talk about overuse of antibiotics in dairy farms and chicken farms and how that can get into the water table and get into the soil and then lead to resistance in something that would never have encountered this antibiotic in the past. Um, and 
so these are my two classes. These are my pilots. We've got an exploring life section, um, and of 18 at this, uh, 19 at this point. One of one student wasn't too fond of this and dropped it. Uh, and then general biology, we have an N of 20. Um, these are both three-hour classes that meet um, twice a week, so lab and lecture are integrated. Um, but the exploring life are all non-majors. General biology are 95% majors in STEM fields or STEM-related fields. Um, and at first, we the students just went out and picked any soil they wanted, and they cultured it. And we were trying stuff out; it didn't grow very well. And then me being sciencey, well, I decided we'd all settle on one soil type, so we'd have a stronger data set. And so we went out to the cedar glades, uh, flat rock cedar glades, just outside of town. We got samples from three different sites: a forest, a glade, and a pond. And then students grew up soils from those sites. And now instead of having 20 different samples from all over the place, we have 20 samples from one location, which leads to better comparisons from group to group. Right. And all along the way, they're getting to make lots of decisions. And usually, they converge on a single methodology, but they get opportunities to try things out in several different ways. So in terms of screening for antibiotics, for instance, they can do something called the patch-patch technique or the spread, te te spread patch technique. There's also the tornado technique and the turtle track technique, which I don't have fun drawings for. But the basic idea is the same. So for the antibiotic production, we're not, we're not crazy enough to give a bunch of freshmen staff or uh, MRSA or, or the nasty pathogens, but we can use safe genetic relatives that will respond the same way as the nasty guys without infecting a whole class with MRSA. And, um, but the basic technique for all these different, these different processes is you make a plate and you coat it with your tester strain, so what are you trying to test against? And then you put your isolates somehow in, a, in proximity to your tester, and then you see do your guys inhibit the nasty guy? Okay. And so this is sort of a, a graphic representation. This is what it looks like in person. So this is testing against P. pudida, which is a um, safe alternative of P. aeruginosa, which is a, a common nosocomal infection. These are the 20, 20 isolates that the students worked with. You can see this isolate here, this isolate here, to a lesser extent this one, this one, and this one, are preventing the growth. So this cloudy white is the bacteria that we're testing against, and you can see nothing is growing. So it's a quick, easy visual assay that students can look at, understand what it means, and, and, and record data that can then be put into a database. Okay? And so we started with about 400 bacterial isolates. This is a typical master plate. They took some samples to make other things. That's why they're polka dotty. Um, they screened a quarter of those just for time and, and effort. I had to make them make decisions as to which ones they wanted to screen. They screened a subset of them. So we screened 100 of these guys against six different safe alternatives to the nasty pathogens. Um, and that same panel of five was also tested to see whether or not they're resistant to three common antibiotics, canamycin, gramycidin, and tetracycline. Um, and this also gives them, lets them do some, some data analysis. So canamycin is, is effective against gram-positive bacteria. Um, gramycidin is effective versus gram-negatives. And tetracycline is a broad-spectrum antibiotic, so it kills pretty much all bacteria. Um, and so they can look. OK, number two wasn't able to grow here, was able to grow here, wasn't able to grow here. Maybe it's gram positive, maybe it's gram negative. So they get visual evidence to try and do some comparison. Um, and then we do genetics, which is scary for me because I'm not a geneticist and we have to relearn how to do it. Um, but we, we cut out a, a 1,500 base pair region of the, the DNA RNA, RNA sequence that makes up a ribosome, which is, is a conserved thing in lots of bacteria. So we've got a little snippet of RNA or DNA. Um, and we amplify it, so we make a billion copies of it through a process called PCR. And then we run a gel to make sure that all of our samples are in the same line, meaning that they're the right size for what we're looking for. So it's another visual thing. And then they take these samples that they isolated. So 18, after two rounds, 18 of the 20 samples we, we amplified worked. So two students were unlucky. I think they actually grew fungus instead of bacteria. That's actually part of it. Um, and then of these, we then sequence them. So we figure out the exact order of A's, G's, C's, and T's. And this is actual data from one of the classes. Um, and 80% of these, we're able to identify the actual species involved. So what bacteria was it? And these are current, very common genetics techniques that they normally won't be exposed to until the third year. They're getting them as freshmen, majors, and not majors. And then we find out nobody found anything new species-wise, but lots of common soil bacteria were isolated. So it confirmed that the assay worked. We didn't get some random marine bacterium. We got the ones that we were looking for. And the other great part of this is there's a huge social media aspect to it. 
So there are Facebook pages um, for the Small World Partners. There's 60 institutions. Faculty have two additional pages where we communicate in back channels back and forth. Um, and people like sharing their results. So you know, here's some chemical abstraction data. Um, this is a faculty member. I think she's in North NC State or where she went. Um, but she didn't know how to, to go past crude chemical extractions. And on the back channel, she and I talked a little bit. And then she was able to, to develop new method methodology that she shared on, on social media. Um, and so this is great because all of these are the lab components, but we're tying lecture um, aspects in with case studies on antibiotic production and resistance and things like that. There's a ton of project ownership. Students love this project. It's real experiments. This data is probably going to get published in a research journal. Um, it emphasizes written and oral communication. The capstone of this is they have to make a scientific poster, which if anybody's interested to, you can come and visit because I'm having them do a virtual poster session. Our new science building has computers all the way around the room. And they're going to stand next to their poster and talk you through the data. So if you'd like to come and see that, let me know. Um, and they have to write up lab reports. So they get, they are reading, they're finding and analyzing scientific literature. I'm not giving them papers. They are finding papers, learning how to do that, and then reading and analyze them. Um, and these microbiology, when these kids get to microbiology, they're going to be set. They've already done a lot of the things that are needed. Um, and it's exciting. They, I have an 8 a.m. class for three hours, and I, people are there every day. I don't have people on their cell phones. They're paying attention. Um, I stole people because we haven't done the presentation yet. These are other small world initiative partners doing the presentations, but we haven't had ours yet, so I'm going to borrow them. Um, but the important thing for me is I'm trying to get more interested in bioeducation. And so when I set this up, I also wanted to get data because, again, I'm sciencey. And so what I'm doing is I'm surveying my students in the non-majors class and the majors class and comparing them to a non-small world initiative honors course that's been taught the same way for about 20 years. SWI is? Small World Initiative, the, the, the program. Yeah. Yeah. And what I'm doing is I'm getting through a series of surveys, are they meeting the content, the learning objectives that are prescribed for the course? Because this isn't a new course, it's a section of a currently existing course. Are they excited about science? And can they think like a scientist, right? And the beauty of this is these are all honors courses, so you have a similar mentality of student. They're all taught at 8 a.m. They all have integrated lab and lectures, so I've controlled for as many variables as I can. The only thing is that I'm not teaching this one, I am teaching these two. How are you, how are you measuring your excitement? Like, like, Through four series of surveys. Yes. So I have um, the biological concept instrument survey. This is, um, are they getting the content? Um, I adapted 20 previously written questions to make sure that they're getting certain learning objectives expected for 11th Gen. The class bio survey. So these three um, were built in conjunction with the program as well. So. Um, I'm partnering with people at Yale and Wisconsin to help analyze this data as well. So the class bio survey is how do students perceive science or STEM? Are they motivated? Are they excited about it? They ask about project ownership. Um, the project ownership survey does more of that. So do they feel like they actually had a project or they were just doing stuff? And then finally, there's the sparsed test, um, which is it's, it's, it's learning objectives with regards to experimental design. So do they know how to design an experiment? Do they know what a hypothesis is? Can they do that sort of thing? And I'm doing these, I've already done pre-surveys for all these, and I'm doing post-surveys at the end of the course. So we can look and track, did it change? So this is your first semester? Yes. Yes. So um, the sparse test, is that kind of similar to the small world initiative that they have to design? Um, it was, it's, yeah, so the, some of our partners designed this in conjunction with it. It's going to be published to be available for other courses as well. Right now, it's in pre-publication format, um, but it should be published soon. Any sense of validity? Do you know what the... Um, the people, I can, I can vouch for the people that wrote it, because they know a lot more about this than I do. Um, but it is, um, I've looked at the survey, it's got, it's a series of about 20, 25 questions, and it's like, interpret this graph, explain this, which of these is a valid hypothesis. Like, for people doing experimental studies in this region of freshman, sophomore, I think it's very appropriate. Um, and uh, my colleagues are all, all worth and spent, they spent a year and a half putting it together and it's going to be published soon. So I think it'll be okay. Um, and so that's sort of where I am now. And like I said, this is the first semester of doing this. And the student, I can vouch for the students being really excited about it. I'm waiting to get this second series of data so I can actually start analyzing it to, to find out. Because I like to think that this is working really well, right? And what I'm, what I, the way I pitched this to my department, because not everybody's, actually very few people are buying into this kind of change, is I, I've said, well, 
maybe my students will suffer from the content slightly, but then they will do better in the experimental design and project ownership. What I'd love to see, and this is me being selfish, is that my non-majors that do this perform better in all four of these than a, than a not a traditional course that's majors. I don't know yet, though. That's why I'm collecting that data. Um, and since we're low on time, I just wanted to point out, like, so you've heard three courses, right? We have other sensor initiatives going right now. So um, I'm going to be doing an honors EXL ecology course in the in the spring, where we're partnering with the Murfreesboro Greenway, and we're doing service-based learning. So they're, they're working in conjunction with the Greenway to develop new research out of the Greenway that they can then present to the Greenway committee at the end of the semester. Um, we have partners um, at UTK as well as other institutions working on solar panel research and trying to get students involved in, in um, green alternative energy. And then most of you have heard of EYH. It's not directly censored, but it's a similar kind of thing where we're getting middle school girls interested in STEM fields. And since Judith had to leave, I wanted to plug that for her because that's her, her baby. Um, and then I just sort of thought I'd leave you with this. I don't know why the numbers decided not to go in order, but we'll go with it. Um, so if this is something that sounds interesting, and we can talk about it afterwards too, but first, you've got you to think about how you can incorporate these ideals. And you might have this great idea, right? And it helps to, to bounce that idea off of people that have had some experience with this. And then I encourage you to go to next year's sensor meetings up until this last point. I am a new faculty member, and I've had some successes, some struggles with my department trying to get these things off the ground. The Honors College is all for it, but the biology department is sort of a mix. And going to this conference and every seminar that they have, it's like, I love doing that. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. And it, it shows you the tools to do this kind of thing. And once you've done this and you have an idea, it's time to talk to your chair and see if there's a way that you can incorporate this. And depending on your department, it may be more or less successful, right? And so the way that I was able to get mine to work is I said, I'll be tracking this simultaneously with a traditional course just to see. Maybe it's a complete waste of time, maybe it's not. And then finally, talk to your IR, talk to our IRB department. Make sure that you can get, um, get um, certification to, to actually survey your students. Because that data, especially in a STEM discipline, is going to be really, really helpful to convince these guys in your department that it actually works because you have data and they understand data. And hopefully you track it for multiple semesters. Anyway, with that, we'll leave it. <laughs> so there's our two initiatives, and we can answer any questions. Do you have any pre-service teachers um, that you know of in the um, I have, I think I have one, one education major. Um, but that would be elementary. Yeah, they're, they're leaning towards elementary um, education. They, want, they started this semester thinking they were going to be biologists, and now they're thinking they'd rather teach it. Um, in a elementary, elementary middle school. Um, the non-majors is mostly recording industry, business, and economics, and sociology. Um, one math person. She's my low. I'm looking up. Is there a Daniel style? No. Um, and then with the majors, it's mostly biology, chemistry, biochemistry, and a couple of other people. But it's only if you're part of the honors program. Um, so it's a honors registered course, so you might not necessarily be enrolled in the honors college, but you have at least a three point five. So these are going to be students that are looking for the smaller class sizes and some more hands on attention through the honors level course. And and speaking to that effect, um, if any of you know Kim Sadler, she's hoping to incorporate aspects of this into the non majors ten thirty classroom, not the whole thing. But like the first couple steps. So like the sequencing the gels that's probably not going to make it, but like isolating bacteria from the soil, learning how to do dilutions, and then screening for antibiotic production, she's hoping to carry that through because the objective is to spread this, right? And be able to like there, there could be a whole other comparison chemistry course where they isolate the bacteria and know it produces a crude chemical that has an effect. You could spend an entire organic or analytical chemistry class then doing the purification of that. And that's that's like down the road big picture sort of stuff that is not in the pipeline yet, but I'd love to see happen. Very exciting that you're doing this integration of this. It's very, it's very doable. It's very mm -hmm. valuable. Yeah, it's very visual. And we have, like, there's databases where they're uploading their data simultaneously with all the other small world initiatives. The small world initiative is, uh, is extending all over the map that you showed Yeah, us. so those are institutions that are community colleges, R1 institutions and regional campuses that are doing this, but 
it's not all geared to the same target audience. So they train us, like they, they had a, a series of labs, we worked with them to look at how we can incorporate those labs in our situation. So most of them actually are second year microbiology courses. A couple of them are introductory majors. There's very few of us that are also training with top majors. There's one guy's doing genetics too. And this was made at Yale? Yeah, so the PI on it is Joe Hamilton, she's at Yale. Um, but we're, but they're very open source about it. So like any research, like if we find a new compound, we log in and do what we want. Um, so they're, they're all about getting this out in response to the engagement. Well, I'm glad you're doing it in a, uh, the 1030 in a non-majors course too. I, I think that's important and I'm glad Kim is going to be working on incorporating that in the non-honor section. I mean, Judith has done really great work for years um, in the PSCI 1130, but we, we can't seem to get um, students to enroll in the non-honor section so they don't make. So yeah. I think that's, I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be great. and. And yeah. yeah, what we're hoping to do, um, so right now we have one section of 1030 honors, and that's been my thing since I've gotten here, but my, I'm a non-tenure track position, so I'll probably, well, my contract is ended. Um, but we're hoping that Kim will then take that on and carry it through. So that course is still there, and since it's the only section of 1030 that's honors, you have more leeway, and you have more creativity, and it provides an excellent piloting ground to do this stuff and carry it forward. So we'll see. But she also has another course that she, where she just off of the biology 1030 and goes out and identifies invasive species or plants and all mm -hmm. that. So. Yeah, Kim is great for this. because She's actually the one that, she forwarded me the initial message about this. And um, so she's been, she's been backing me up on it since the beginning. It would be interesting to try to see if it's a non-major that's going to end up in my major that's going to be mm -hmm. nice. I have two that are at least switching to bio minors as a result. Um, last year we weren't doing this, but I was still trying to get rid of the measure of potato peg labs. And um, I had one student who was a music major. She dropped her music major. She is now a biology major. She did um, uh, Eureka research with me over the summer, and now she's going to be doing an RD probably in the summer. And she's like joined the biology club and everything. So, like, these kinds of activities definitely catch a subset of those non majors. Your department chair should be happy about that. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a way to sell this. Too. Yeah. yeah. And, and biology has been lucky in that we're one of the few departments that aren't losing students. We're, we're still we're about even. Um, but that's kind of my hope, too, is that because these are practical skills that they're going to need. Like, they don't need to be able to follow a recipe. They need to be able to think at this point. So being able to do these kinds of things. And I acknowledge that incorporating this activity into 30 lab sections is going to take a lot of effort and may not be feasible, but offering it as an alternative, right, maybe five sections, that seems doable. And then you're going to attract the students that are looking for that research path, an opportunity to get involved in, with it early on. Well, I think this is all about, we're all about retention, mm -hmm. and this addresses that. On a number of levels, not just student retention, right. but the university, but retention. Right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, with this is just how I'm approaching it with chemistry, and King and Judith both have approaches for for physical science and chemistry. And so, what's been great about being involved with Sensor is we can bounce cross disciplinary ideas around a lot. And the people that you meet at the conference, some of them are in your field, some of them are not, but they all have this same common goal, right? Of change, mixing it up, change one. So the engineering and technology, do they have their own thing going on too now? Uh, you mean with regards to MTSU or in general? In this um, or in sensor? Yeah. Um, well, we have some. I would say that biology and chemistry, would you agree, are more represented? But there are some people in technology fields that are that were there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I just tended to go to the lectures that had to do more with with my field. Some uh, and it's culture, agriculture, environmental engineering. And our TN score partners, they're all about solar, solar panels and engineering new types of yeah. solar panels and things like that. So we have connections with those, but in terms of at MTSU, that's something Judith wants to expand into. So, yeah. oh, 
sensor is it's a bigger program and then there's an issue underneath that, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So like technically small world is not directly related to sensor. Okay. It's just that this is a way to take the ideal of the sensor. And I don't think you just gave the definition. It's, um, science education for new <laughs> civic engagements and responsibilities. So it's all about service based learning and and civic engagement, civic engagement and getting real world practical knowledge as opposed to just measuring a potato. I would love for our pre service, like elementary and secondary, to have like science there and either that they could be there. And we had at the conference, we had there's a whole day or so, like there's they invite high school teachers in yeah. to try and this see some of this. This is how we want too. them to teach, yeah. but it's not it's not modeled for them. Yeah. Um, and so it's well, especially I guess in the public realm, but like some like there were I was interacting quite quite a bit with one fact, uh, teacher at a local Asheville high school, and she she wants to do this. Oh yeah. And she and she and it's a small enough school. I think it was a um, a charter school where she can try and actually get that. that and and if they're if they're private schools and charter schools. They don't necessarily fall under the high stakes assessment. Right. Sort of have, have the same issues that, that um, Judith was talking about, and that you were talking about too, regarding we've got all this content we got to cover, and we've got this much time, and we got to get it to them, get it to them, get it to them. It doesn't really lend itself to covering all that content, but the science practices, you know, the science reasoning and, and, the, and the process of, of you know, the nature of science, that's what ultimately, in my mind, they should be doing. And the nice thing is if you can, you know, down the road, if you can build cross-disciplinary collaborations where, like, you know that your STEM major is going to have to take an intro chemistry class and an intro biology class, and so there's some carry through from one project to another. Like, ideally, that's the way that it could go, and it would be great. And it takes a lot of effort and communication to get that kind of thing going, but, but you know. Yeah, but they could be writing in, 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 their, in their courses as it, as it relates. Actually, to that's something Kim is working on. She's partnering with an English professor. Um, and she wants them to be co-listed with his English class and her biology class, so that the written components for the English class are directly related, related to the project that she's teaching. Yeah, you can keep the pragmatic of the the volume. There's so many classes. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, thank you, Drew. Yeah, thank, thank you, guys. You. Very interesting. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're the only two. Yeah, but what's really interesting is 